the Spanish Civil War erupted in 1936. It was a classic confrontation for modern times, the rich against the poor. Fascists against communists. The right versus the left. It was also a puppet show preamble to the main event, which would soon explode, World War II. Orwell quickly obtained journalist credentials and with his bride Eileen headed for Barcelona. He wanted to be more than just a war correspondent. He's supposed to have told his publisher when he asked him why he was going, well, someone's got to kill fascists. I mean, he's much more like an early American Republican. You know, if you feel there's injustice, you, um, you unsling your gun from the um, cottage or farmstead door and you go out and join the militia. And he did just that, joining up with a workers' militia called the POUM, the POUM. He knew the Pumistas were fighting the right-wing fascists, but he knew little about the political complexities of the Spanish left. There was vicious infighting between some of the workers' groups and the communist forces, supported by the Russian Communist Party. Orwell was soon caught up in more than one war. And this is, I think, the hardest thing for non-Spaniards to understand, especially in America, we associate the communists with a revolutionary line. And here in Spain, the communists were actually against the revolution. And that's what I think is very confusing for us to understand. But I think in this case, the communists in Spain were following the foreign policy concerns of the Soviet Union and Stalin rather than the concerns of the workers within Spain. Stalin was concerned that a victory for the workers in Spain would alarm Western nations. He wanted total power over where and when workers would revolt against their bosses. Orwell was outraged at the Russians' betrayal. During a skirmish in April 1936, Orwell was wounded, shot through the throat. It would affect his speech for the rest of his life. He was sent to Barcelona to recover. But once there, Orwell was dismayed to find the solidarity of the leftists had splintered into factional fighting. The Stalinists were soon rounding up the militia and arresting their leaders. George Orwell and his wife fled north. It was a close escape. By the spring of 1939, the fascists had won. It was a devastating defeat for the left, and Orwell was convinced that Stalin's divisive campaign of deceit and terror was responsible for the victory of the fascist general Franco. In the autumn of 1940, the Battle of Britain began. Hitler ordered the bombing of civilian population centers. In spite of daily air raids, Orwell took a few months to write a book, a kind of children's fable that reflected on his experience with the communists in Spain. It was his first major breakthrough book. Animal Farm begins with the idealistic farm animals rebelling and driving the human owner out of the place. At first they enjoy their freedom and equality, but gradually they realize that some animals have become more equal than others. All the characters from the Russian Communist Revolution, disguised as various animals, make an appearance. A pig called Napoleon, the most vicious pig of all, is of course Stalin. I think Animal Farm, in Orwell's intention, certainly, is a lament for the revolution betrayed. Animal Farm is very different in tone from 1984. One reason might be that Orwell's wife, Eileen, had a big impact on the writing, with her comments and her contributions. It's a much more accessible book than 1984, and it's um, no, nothing like so despairing. The vision of a dark, forbidding world of the future in 1984 
may be connected to the tragic turn of events that occurred in Orwell's life. In 1945, just as Animal Farm was about to be published, just as the dark war years were ending and he had adopted a son in anticipation of a brighter future, his wife Eileen died during routine surgery. It was completely unexpected. Less than a year after her death, Orwell made his decision to leave London with his two-year-old son and move to the island of Jura. He immediately began work on 1984. This was his last book. He was dying when he wrote it. And I think the combination of despair about Europe, despair about the political future, and despair about his own survival do make this one of the most terrifying books one has ever read. Steamer! Dead over it! Get down! Get down! Nineteen eighty four has been made into a film three times. In the most recent version, John Hurt is Winston Smith. Rough times fourteen two eighty four, page three by line two should read Miniprod forecast increased chucker ration April. During the day, his job involves destroying the past, but at night he trawls through London desperate to find the truth about the past. Can I help you? What's this? Oh, it's a beautiful thing. It's over a hundred years old. Cost you four dollars. Oranges and lemons, say the bells of St. Clemens. What was that? Something old. Orwell idealized what was simple and pure. On Dura, Orwell noticed the birds. He noticed every little flower and bird. And maybe there was some little thing of hope in the very bleakness of the landscape that spoke to him. I think if you're in a very bleak place and the first primrose comes or the first swallow flies in, it means so much to you. There was never anything as sophisticated as two-way telescreens in communist bloc countries during the Cold War. Smoke and tear gas bombs, sometimes boomerang on the East German troops. But there were hidden microphones and wiretaps everywhere. There have been many reports of shootings. It was an all-consuming paranoia, and it was something Orwell saw coming. I'm 39 and I've had four children. Now look! One and two and one. Winston rarely talks to women. His only relationship seems to be with the shrill, authoritarian instructor on the telescreen. Remember our fighting men. Then something totally unexpected happens. Winston has noticed that Julia, the girl from the fiction department, has been sneaking glances at him. He assumes that she is with the thought police. She stages a clumsy fall and manages to slip him a note. It's the start of a clandestine and dangerous love affair. Right the 
The first secret encounter between Winston and Julia in 1984 is in the countryside. It's the only place where there are a few gaps in the web of the ever watchful telescreens. Winston discovers that Julia has slept with many men. It excites him. Listen, the more men you've had, the more I love you. I hate purity, I hate goodness. I don't want any virtue to exist anywhere. I want everyone to be corrupt to the bones. Well then, I ought to suit you, dear. I'm corrupt to the bones. Good news for all the young women in the anti-sex leagues. Big Brother wants to reward you for your efforts to abolish illicit sex in every nook and cranny of Oceana. The lovers rent a cheap room above the pawn shop. Even though it seemed odd that there was no telescreen, they continued their rebellion, for that is what it was. To be caught would lead to torture or death, or perhaps something worse. The most powerful form of science fiction is not a novel or a movie or a story that accurately predicts a future. It's a story that prevents a future. One of the most powerful self-preventing prophecies of all time was George Orwell's 1984, um, which conveyed an image that was so horrifying that millions of people uh, t said to themselves, I am going to devote a certain fraction of my effort for the rest of my life to making sure that this won't happen. Now that's powerful. That's powerful literature.